Um, and the next person I'm talking about is Sir Samuel Lewis. He was a Sierra Leone mayor, uh, uh, mayor of Freetown, and he was a lawyer. And he was the first West African ever to be knighted. And he was also the third Sierra Leonean to, be, uh, uh, to qualify as a barrister. He was something of a child prodigy. Um, he kind of rushed through school at the age of 13. Um, they thought he was ready enough to go to college. And so I had intended to do, and I will do something on his birthday, which is the uh, 29th of November. Yeah, it was born 29th of November, 1843. And uh, his parents are uh, originally both Yoruba, actually. And um, he came to uh, university college in the UK. And eventually, um, again, somebody who studied at the bar, he entered Middle Temple, um, which is where my father was also called uh, to the bar. And in 1868, and they have this annual competition and to everybody's astonishment, an African, a black African won the competition to present on um, uh, real estate and land. And um, it was astonishing. And so straight away, his profile was raised. And, you know, so when he was eventually knighted uh, in 1896, again, if you go to the British newspapers, there was a lot of discussion about a black person. You, you see it, in fact, they said a Negro person being knighted. What has he done to deserve a knighthood? And so there was a, a, a Reverend P.D. Dublin uh, of D Dominica, who had been the colonial chaplain in, in Sierra Leone for a while. And so he wrote to the um, Dominica Guardian on May the 27th, 1896, trying to address, and then he sent it to all the British press. And so it was carried to the British press. And this is what he said. He said, I beg you to banish from your mind the idea that Sir Samuel Lewis is an inferior man in any way in the company of the other knights of the order of St. Michael and St. George. Mr. Lewis would compare very favorably in the matter of chiseled features, education, culture, polish. He is a Negro, but his brother knights would soon very well have to acknowledge that a mighty intellect lies within that Negro's frame. That was covered across England 30, 40 newspapers carried it, and it kind of silenced it to the extent that when he was sick and he came back to England, he, he died of cancer. Um, uh, every newspaper worthy of the name carried uh, details about his funeral, and, and they wrote long obituaries. But one of the things that made him start to agitate when he went back to Sierra Leone was something that happened three years after he'd been knighted by no less than uh, Queen Victoria. He was traveling from Freetown to Songo and he tried to board a train. Um, it was Easter Monday and the train, the first class was full, all the other carriages were full. The only carriage that had lots of seats was a whites only carriage. We actually had them in Sierra Leone in the 1900s. And so he tried to board that carriage and a white soldier slapped his servant and slapped Sir Samuel and pushed them off the train and said, this carriage is for whites only. Um, interestingly, some Sierra Leoneans came to the um, <laughs> defense of the soldier and said that he hadn't done it out of anything to do with race. That's a nonsense. The thing is, he would never have done it to a white man. He would never. And so he was fined 30 shillings and he was ordered to apologize to Sir Samuel, which he did. But it also strengthened Sir Samuel's determination about maybe it's fine, I can come to England, I could walk through London and not get abused, but I go back to my own country and something like this happens to me. And so, Sir Samuel Lewis, please read, learn more about him. Very inspirational figure. And then Sir Milton Magai, yes, he was our first prime minister at independence, but as I said, he was much more than that. 
this is a person where if you go back and unfortunately um, or fortunately um, if you come to the National Archives in Kew in London in West London you can actually read some of the parliamentary papers and some of the things he said they seem almost unbelievable now and because he challenged first of all he as I said he appointed Ella Kobulu Bulama as the first female cabinet minister in Sub-Saharan Africa but in the minutes of those parliamentary meetings and cabinet meetings, he challenged his ministers and their ministries saying, go out there and think of innovative things that can set us apart because we have the intellect to deliver on these things. And who could imagine a, um, a small African country, just a few million people thinking such a ridiculous thing that we could come with something that was you know, fresh, daring, innovative, but then innovation has long been there in Sierra Leone. We have the likes of grammar school. You know, I've like mentioned Francis Claudia Wright. Um, you know, imagine it was under his uh, 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 patronage that when you read the thing now, it seems beyond belief that anybody could think in 1964, is there a way that we could design stamps that we don't have to lick? And Sierra Leone, first in the world. 9th February 1964, we came up with self-adhesive stamps. Two years before anybody else, 20 years before the United Kingdom, 20 years. And even the Americans who came two years after us had to stop it for about four years because their stamps, the glue they used to make it self-adhesive was defective. And so they had to go back to the drawing board. We never had to go back to the drawing board, you know? Sierra Leone attended the, the, the World Trade Fair uh, in, in New York. And, and it was there that they met this uh, Canadian, uh, Jordi Bonnet. Any of you know the mural on the front of our central bank? This kind of avant-garde looking thing. Look in the bottom right corner and you'll see the name, Jay Bonnet, Jordi Bonnet. Uh, this guy was a one-armed guy who painted, he carved, and they met him there and they loved his work and they asked him, would you do a mural for uh, our central bank, which is being built? And this is what he came up with. It's there. You, you can't miss it. You stand opposite post office and you look at the central bank. There's this fantastic avant-garde mural and which he in included something, including things like the game of worry. There's a kind of avant-garde representation of the game of worry is included in that mural and it's stunning. And interestingly, when he died, his family did a, a kind of collection online of all the murals he had done around the world, and they did not include that one. That was not until I told them that it existed, and I sent them the photographs of it with his signature in the bottom, and they've now included it amongst his great works around the world. So Sir Milton Magai and all these people, what they bequeathed to us as people growing up in Sierra Leone was a striving for excellence. You know, as mentioned, they encourage us to think big and dream big dreams. You know, first country in the world where women can vote, 1792. You know, soon after all this, things began to change very, very quickly. Six years after independence, we had our first coup d'etat. I have personal experience of that. I can mention it at another time. But I was one of those who, my father was in the then APC that won the elections. We were outside state house waiting for them to be sworn in when the soldiers moved in and dispersed us, or most of us. Those who weren't dispersed were then shot at and several were killed. But unforgettable, 1967, imagine a mere six years after that. And that coup wasn't just a hiccup, which we thought it was, because it exposed deep divisions in our society that actually up to now, politicians have continued to exploit, particularly in terms of party allegiances based solely on tribal affiliations. I went to school at CKC in Bo after I left Sierra Leone Grammar School. And obviously if you know Bo, it's a Mende area. 99% of the boys there, their parents would never think of voting anything other than SLPP. That was the kind of situation that we were now having in the country. So in the 1940s, right up to the early 70s and 90s, so learners who studied abroad did so with one intention, and that was to go back to develop our country. From that uh, period on, after the 1970s, that percentage got smaller and smaller of the ones going back. And I, I can say that my generation, 
were the first of what I call the disappointed generation, who we went with all the dreams and ambitions of our parents who studied abroad. My parents were the ones who had helped form and had belonged to WASU, the West African Students Union. In fact, my parents lived two streets apart in Freetown, and yet they met at a WASU dance in London at Porchester Hall. So I have many things to thank the West African Students Union for, including bringing my parents together. Um, so, you know, um, I know time is, uh, you know, against us. So I'll, I'm getting towards the end. And um, as I said, I don't want this to be um, kind of depressing because um, in the early 2000s, myself and others, we formed what we call the Sierra Leone Diaspora Network with the intention, amongst other things, of making sure that those of us who did want to go back, because, you know, as I said, we were getting to that age where we were thinking of retiring and we were saying that no way were we going to retire in the West. But also we got our education in Sierra Leone and we felt we owed Sierra Leone something. And part of that something was to go back. But we found out that those who kind of rushed and went back, including my older brother, two years older than me, they went back ill-informed. Going there every Easter or Christmas and having a great time is not the same as living there. And so what the Sierra Leone diaspora did was, amongst other things, we made sure that anybody who wanted to go back, we provided you with a pack which told you all the information that you needed to know. It told you about taxes you needed to pay. It told you about what the best schools were. It told you about, you know, everything really that you would need um, in order to say, okay, I'm going now from a position of being properly informed. And we broke it down, warts and all. We didn't sugar it. We didn't think, oh, you know, it's going to be nice. It's going to be dandy. Uh, this is what it's like. Not at all. We wanted it to be the real thing because we were fed up of people going there, staying there for six months a year and then returning to the West. We wanted that. If you go there before you went, you were well informed. And so, you know, this is something, and I said, it wasn't going to be depressing. And I think this is something, it's, I'm throwing it as a challenge because to the younger ones, I'm saying that you need to revive something like this. For those who want to connect or reconnect with the Sierra Leone, they should consider reviving this particular tool and taking the initiative to get back to a point where striving for excellence becomes the norm. You know, so to those who are artists and would be artists and the parents, I say to them, actually, let's celebrate the rich diversity that makes up our culture. And we can tell the world that though we didn't invent jollof rice, nobody cooks it better than us. We all know that. And as for cassada leaf, petete leaf, don't even go there. So if your talent is that you're a great singer, sing. Great footballer, play. And if your parents are listening and watching, encourage them. Don't discourage them. Don't say, yes, you're a great footballer, but I want you to be a doctor. Nurture that talent. Don't neuter it. Encourage their passions. But most of all, teach them to dream big, wild, outrageous dreams, and to always think outside the box. And so next year, when I come to Slackfest, I want somebody to say to me, you know what? I heard your talk. You challenged me to dream big. Guess what I did? I've designed a car that's better than Tesla, and it goes into production next year. Ladies, gentlemen, everybody, thank you for listening. Sierra Leone can be great again if we want it to be. Thanks for listening. Woo!